Good afternoon, and welcome to CSIS. My name is Catherine Bliss, and I'm a Deputy Director and Senior Fellow in the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first in a speaker series, a high-level speaker series, that we will be hosting over the next few months focused on non-communicable diseases. And as you know, the UN will be convening a high-level summit in September of 2011 to discuss these issues and attempt to share information and share lessons learned and also articulate a set of recommendations and solutions for governments seeking information and working together to address this emerging challenge. We are very fortunate today to have with us to kick off this series Dr. Harvey Feinberg. Dr. Feinberg is the president of the Institute of Medicine here in Washington, D.C. He has been at the Institute of Medicine since 2001, following a number of years as dean, as provost of Harvard, and before that, uh, dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. And his academic career has focused on the intersection of health policy and medicine in developing countries and in developed countries. So we are very fortunate to have him here today to talk to us about the emerging epidemic of non-communicable disease, the health and policy implications of this transition and what we're witnessing, particularly in low and middle income countries. And Dr. Feinberg will discuss the health and policy implications of this disease burden and how the United States is addressing these issues and how it will be able to assist um, other countries in dealing with this emerging challenge. So before I turn the microphone over to Dr. Feinberg, I want to just let you know that we, our second event in this series will take place in February, um, on February 16th, so be sure to mark your calendars and plan to attend that session as well. And at that point, we will welcome Jean-Luc Battel to speak on tackling the global NCD epidemic, how the private sector can and should be part of the solution. So um, I'll say a little bit more about that at the end of our session. But uh, let me now invite Dr. Feinberg to address the nascent ep epidemic, what we know about global non-communicable disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for your kind introduction. It's really a pleasure for me to be with you here at CSIS, and especially to have a chance to talk with you about a challenge for global health that is emerging, that is underappreciated, and that is crying out for intense action from the United States and from countries around the world. I think it's very fitting that CSIS has chosen to embark on this series looking at the non-communicable diseases at the time that the world is beginning to focus on this problem in preparation for the WHO summit that Catherine alluded to in September of this coming year. And I want to begin my reflections on the problem of non-communicable diseases by taking a step back to global health and what we mean by global health. There are at least five different ways that people think about it. The first is they think of global health as the problems of disease unique to poorer countries in the world. They think of global health as the disease problems unique to the poor countries of the world. A second meaning of global health is they think of global health as the diseases that are prevalent in poor countries of the world. That's not the same as the first, and it's especially an important distinction we'll come back to when we think about non-communicable diseases. A third framing of global health is thinking about diseases and health systems comparatively from one country or region to another country or region. So in that context, global health could be a north-north comparison, developed industrialized countries. It could be a south-south comparison. It could be north-south. But it's essentially framing the problem as a comparative look at health systems and disease problems in different parts of the world. Another way people think about global health is that they think it applies especially to what one might call transnational health problems. Transnational health problems are those problems that you cannot apprehend or deal with 
from a single country point of view or even from a multitude of individual countries working independently. The problems are interdependent and across all. Problems such as environmental pollutants, for example, or the oceans. Uh, you cannot deal with those problems country by country as they impinge on health. And finally, another framing of global health is the notion of global health as public health, that is, a population health perspective, where the population of interest is the entire population of the earth. It is public health with a perspective not of a single community, not of a single country, not of a single region, but global health as public health with a concern about the health of people everywhere. Now, these different definitions are not really mutually exclusive. They're reinforcing, but they illustrate an important backdrop to thinking about non-communicable diseases. And that is that those who have thought about global health only as the disease problems uniquely situated in poorer countries of the world will necessarily downplay chronic diseases and non-communicable diseases which are prevalent in wealthy countries of the world. But here is the central fact that I want to leave with you in these few minutes. The central fact is that the burden of disease in poor countries simply because it is greater for communicable disease does not mean it is not also greater for non-communicable disease. And the facts of the matter are that non-communicable diseases as a global burden, looking at the health of peoples everywhere, are predominantly not just largely, predominantly problems of low and middle income countries. If you look at the total number of deaths from non-communicable diseases in the world, approximately 80% of those deaths occur in low and middle income countries. 80% of the global deaths from non-communicable diseases occur in low and middle income countries. If you look at a country like uh, South Asia, like India and Pakistan, for example, together, mortality in those countries from non-communicable disease is more than twice the mortality from all infectious diseases. And if you look even in sub-Saharan Africa, where the burden of HIV AIDS is so predominant, a country like Nigeria has almost as many deaths from non-communicable diseases as from all infectious diseases combined. If you ask about particular diseases like diabetes, more than three quarters of all diabetes-related deaths occur in low and middle income countries. And these diseases are very costly to the economies and to the well-being of those countries. For example, between the years 2005 and 2015, it's been estimated that the three countries of China, India, and Russia may lose between 200 and 550 billion dollars of national income just because of the three conditions of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. Now, I want to draw an important distinction so that we're all thinking about these problems in the same way. Sometimes people associate communicable diseases with acute diseases, and they associate non-communicable diseases with chronic diseases. Oftentimes, those are accurate associations, but they're not necessarily so. There are communicable diseases which are chronic. Indeed, HIV AIDS is a very prominent example. Schistosomiasis, many other very prevalent diseases in the world, quite apart from the acute infections of malaria or influenza. 
And at the same time, you can have a non-communicable event. You can have a hemorrhagic stroke, which is acute and maybe lethal, but it's not an infectious disease. It's not a communicable disease. But by and large, when we think about the problem and the burden of non-communicable diseases, we are talking about conditions that have the attribute of chronicity, that linger, that affect people for year after year after year, that produce morbidity, reduction in productivity, as well as illness and premature mortality. So we're dealing with a set of conditions in the world that are more important than recognized, even when you look at it from the perspective of individual countries or of the low and middle income countries as a whole. What is particularly intriguing about the non-communicable diseases from a global point of view and from a international relationship point of view is the degree to which countries, whether wealthy or poor, share a common interest in preventing and dealing efficiently and relentlessly with these diseases. Do you know that the burden of disease in the world overall, projected over the next 10 to 20 years, you know what the leading overall burden of disease is likely to be? It's likely to be psychiatric and neurodegenerative disease. And problems like depression, which also affect the lives of young people and take lives prematurely and produce enormous social disruption as we've witnessed in our own country recently in Tucson. These problems of psychiatric illness are prevalent in the world being compounded by the neurogenerative diseases which are accelerating in prevalence because of the aging of the population and represent a very substantial challenge to the world. So the thing to remember so far of what I've said is that these non-communicable diseases are a serious and even overwhelming problem in the poor countries as well as in the wealthy countries. Now, a second point that I want to emphasize is that you can deal with these problems after they occur or you can deal with these problems before they occur. You can adopt strategies that are predominantly about treatment and rehabilitation and management of disease, or you can adopt strategies that are about preventing disease, forestalling their development, diminishing their secondary impacts. Of the two, they both have a place. But the preventive strategy has the great advantage of, when it works, producing so much better results because you avoid disease altogether. When it works, it saves not just heartache and grief over time, but it saves dollars. When it works, it has the opportunity to make a difference not just in individual lives, but in the lives of communities and whole nations. It can be done. Consider a country like Finland, which in the 1960s had one of the highest rates of heart disease in the world. Finland adopted a set of strategies focused mainly on education, improvements in the environment of living, and especially bringing together many sectors of society, the health professionals and government uh, working together to help educate the public, change patterns of living. In the 1960s, if you visited Finland, uh, everybody was buttering their bread. Today, the surveys suggest that fewer than 5% are buttering their bread. And the effects have been nothing short of astonishing. The mortality rate among working age men from coronary heart disease in Finland has declined by 85% by 2006 compared to just three decades earlier. Now, it is true that heart disease has been on the decline 
in many countries, including the United States, though it remains a dominating problem. But the results in Finland suggest that concerted act action by government, health professionals, and a public can make remarkable and dramatic differences. So the second point is that these conditions can be confronted by prevention as well as by more effective treatments. And a third point that is very important is that the interventions that are effective in preventing one chronic disease often will have benefit to prevent other chronic disease. The prime example of that, of course, is tobacco and smoking, where when you reduce the burden of tobacco, you not only reduce the burden of cancer, you reduce the burden of heart disease. When you deal with diet and nutrition and the problem of obesity, which is a huge problem in the United States, but a prevalent and growing problem elsewhere, including in some developing countries. You not only can deal with the reduction in diabetes, you can also reduce the burden of joint disease. And you can impact also on other chronic diseases and high blood pressure and problems that follow from that. So the third key point is that interventions that can work against one disease can simultaneously have broad benefit across many. And a final point that I want to leave you with is that it is in the vital self-interest of the United States to be actively engaged in the global efforts to reduce non-communicable disease burden. It's true across all diseases, but it's especially true for those conditions where we in the U.S. also have a disproportionate burden from these same diseases. So that advances that are made anywhere can be transferred and taken advantage of elsewhere. Lessons that can be learned about prevention and treatment, including the testing of interventions for disease at different stages that can be done anywhere in the world can be adapted and used everywhere including in the United States. It is, in other words, in our enlightened self-interest to be actively engaged in a global effort to reduce the burden of non-communicable disease. I want to just conclude by saying that from the vantage point of the CSIS and others who are now mobilizing, including the National Institutes of Health, and I'm so pleased Aaron is here from the National Institute of heart, lung, and blood to uh, represent the NIH's efforts in these, uh, in these domains. And we have growing attention in the World Health Organization as evidenced by uh, the uh, program coming in September. You will find, uh, if you uh, are interested, a brief uh, description of a study about reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease in the world that was conducted at the Institute of Medicine and which will be a part of an ongoing effort to do what we can to help promote more effective interventions in countries around the world. It's something that we can do, in other words, institutionally, individually, and as a society to help promote the reduction of the burden of chronic disease in the world. It's a great venture. It will be a long-term effort. But I, for one, look forward very much to joining with you and others uh, who will undertake the task. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your comments and questions. Dr. Feinberg, thank you for setting out not just one or two definitions of global health for us, but at least five for us to consider as we think about the emerging challenge of chronic diseases, of non-communicable diseases, and the ways in which countries may be able to work together to articulate both the problems, the extent of the challenge, and innovate
common solutions, uh, both in September and, and beyond. Uh, you've made a very strong case for why the global community, both in lower and middle income countries as well as the developed countries, needs to work together to address this particular challenge. And I want to start just by picking up on, on some of the points that you made about the economic challenges associated with um, non-communicable diseases in, um, you know, across the world in, the develop in developed countries as well as the, the lower and middle income countries. And, you know, we've seen that, you know, increasingly uh, lack of productivity, inability to um, participate, you know, in the workplace on a regular basis is, is something that can be, you know, an increasing challenge for um, communities that are seeing higher rates of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and, and other conditions. And I wanted to ask you to say a little bit about the role that you see the private sector playing in addressing this challenge, either in, in working directly through through companies, through workplace programs to improve employee health um, and, and working in the, in the community, as well as contributing to some of the global solutions that uh, will be discussed in September and, and which we'll be working on for years to come. Yeah. I think there's a really exciting uh, set of forces converging to make it both attractive and compelling for uh, industry, for private business to be uh, directly and actively engaged in efforts to reduce these disease burdens. Uh, first, uh, if you f set aside for a moment the global aspect of this, just think about domestic uh, issues and domestic uh, needs. Uh, if you are a company with a workforce, uh, the advantage you have to a workforce which has reduced absenteeism, reduced cost of health care and increased satisfaction from a set of programs that promote good health and by their nature prevent the development of diseases, programs that work on nutrition, that encourage uh, exercise, that uh, reduce uh, specifically stress in different ways uh, in the workforce, that uh, reward people who give up and who refrain from uh, smoking that give people ample time for family and, uh, and child development particularly. When you put these kind of packages together, you've got a healthier, more satisfied, more productive workforce. So uh, companies uh, are discovering this over and over again, and there are a number of really uh, exciting examples, uh, uh, including a company like Safeway uh, here and nationally, but many others that have really demonstrated how they can uh, encourage a healthier workforce. Then when you move to the truly global companies that have a workforce in many parts of the world, uh, you consider a Walmart uh, as a prime example, a Walmart that just uh, recently uh, made a, a policy decision that was publicly announced about changing its entire line of uh, house brand foods to bring them more into line with nutritional guidelines, sound uh, choices for people and families, a very exciting uh, step forward. Exciting because it's not just good public relations, it's good business. The fastest growing sectors in many uh, food uh, industries actually are the health food s sectors. And when you can mainstream these, in a dramatic way, uh, the chances are very good that you will do well by doing good as a company. And then when you're a global company uh, and can introduce these policies and practices in your workforce around the world, you not only help the employees themselves, but you can serve as a model for what is possible to accomplish in different kinds of settings. And you naturally will adapt uh, the programs, their specifics to fit the needs of your workers in different parts of the world. But you have the same goals, you have the same principles, the same kinds of opportunities, and it's very exciting. So industry, in the first instance, working with its own uh, workforce and working both domestically and globally uh, has a very, very significant role. Secondly, as illustrated by the Walmart example and others, there's a lot of good business to be made 
by, uh, by promoting healthier products. Because as the public becomes more aware of the choices and wants to make smarter choices for themselves, the companies that will be in a position to meet that need will be uh, the ones who are advantaged. Uh, now, you have to set aside, and it's a separate issue to talk about tobacco, because uh, there we're dealing with a, uh, a product that is fundamentally an addictive uh, product. We still have uh, almost one in five of the adult population in the U.S. still smoking. It's half what it was, but it's a hardcore. The remaining smokers, on average, smoke more uh, cigarettes. And so there's, there's a need for creative thinking about what I would call the third stage strategies around tobacco reduction and elimination, which fully confront the addictive nature of the nicotine and, and the product. So that, that's a separate uh, issue where private sector contributions in pharmaceutical and other, uh, other arrangements will also uh, definitely play a part, but which is a, a, separate, uh, a separate problem. And then you have the opportunity for business to develop more cost-effective, value-adding technology that can be applied in different parts of the world. If you create in India an EKG measuring machine that is $125 in cost compared to 10 times that cost for an equivalent machine in the U.S., and you get that approved, you're going to have a huge market in the United States. It's going to go in that direction, as well as opportunity for U.S. and uh, European and uh, Asian companies to develop products that are going to be more successful for chronic disease uh, in, uh, in their homes. If you develop less invasive models for intervention in advanced cardiovascular disease, there's going to be a huge continuing market for that kind of uh, product. If you create safer, simpler ways of preventing uh, the secondary effects of high blood pressure, you will have, uh, you'll have another huge global market. So there's going to be tremendous opportunity, there is tremendous opportunity for the private sector to take advantage of these opportunities where the same needs exist in wealthy and in poor countries. So those are some of the things that I would point to uh, immediately uh, where the private sector can be quite uh, directly and successfully involved. Thank you. Uh, you've mentioned uh, the issue of, of exercise and getting people more physically active and, and also the issue of, of addiction. And so I'm thinking of getting people addicted to exercise in a way. And um, last year in, in March, the Global Health Policy Center, uh, along with the Pan American Health and Education Foundation and the U.S. Mexico Chamber of Commerce, hosted a session here on the emerging challenge of noncommunicable diseases on the U.S. Mexico border. And one of the key you know, issues that, that we heard from a number of the speakers was the fact that you know, cities along the border have developed in such a way that people do not feel that they can really get out and exercise. Violence is a concern for people. Um, there aren't parks where they feel comfortable going and, and that kind of thing. And it really highlighted the importance of bringing the transportation sector, urban planning, um, the education sector, and, and others into the conversation. And I wonder, you know, if you could say a little bit about the, the challenges associated with kind of that, that sort of multi-sectoral approach and what the promises, you know, might be, what, what some of the reasons that, you know, we really need to try to bring these groups together. Yeah. It's a really important point, uh, Catherine, because, you know, when it comes to dealing with and especially preventing uh, chronic diseases, the array of uh, interventions and the combinations that you want to put together often, in fact, I would say maybe dominantly come from outside the narrowly construed health system. They come from our schools. They come from our design of our communities. They come from our walkways. They come from recreational facilities. They come from the work uh, standards and policies that we were just talking about before. So there is a very, very great need for a health mindset to be available and a part of the thinking of those who don't think of their main 
interests as having to do with health and whether that's foreign affairs or it's agriculture or it's the environment or it is education. Uh, there's a need to have the dialogue working well enough that uh, all of the leadership in these sectors can envision a way that they can accomplish their goals but do it better in a way that simultaneously advances the health of uh, people individually and of whole communities. Uh, so a lot of this uh, especially starts with the way we design our communities. If you design a community where you've got to get in a car to go shopping, you just cannot get there by walking, well, people are not going to walk to go, uh, to go shopping. So that's not a very smart way we know now to design a community. Uh, if you design a community so that you have mixed use available to people that they get out and that there's work and there's recreation and there's social interaction readily available for people, that creates a very different environment than the communities which are isolated and isolating. It creates a different environment for mental health as well as for physical health. When you think about the role of the schools, it's, uh, it's profound. You, everything from literally what we teach and how we teach, when we give math problems to children that are word problems, why shouldn't the content of the word problem actually be ed educational itself? Why shouldn't the content of the word problem also convey relevant messages that are meaningful to the lives of children? Uh, when we think about a school environment, what's available in the vending machines can be just as educational as what you're told uh, in the classroom. I was uh, recently visiting uh, the Google uh, campus in California. And uh, it's a very interesting company for lots of reasons, of course, uh, including what you may have heard about the famous uh, cafeterias that they have uh, throughout their campus. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but there are a lot of them. And apparently they've been from the beginning free to the uh, to the employees, there's no you don't pay uh, to eat. And and when the then president, he's just announced stepping down, Eric Schmidt was asked, why do you why do you give the food away in the cafeterias? His reply was, well, why should I pay my employees to pay me for their food? So uh, that was kind of an interesting philosophy. I I like that. But here's. <laughs> Here's why I'm telling this story. I was on a floor that had a vending machine. And the vending machine was the most interesting vending machine I've ever encountered because the pricing on the products in the vending machine had nothing to do with what you would find in the store. It had to do with how unhealthy they were. <laughs> if you wanted your fats and sugars, you could get them, but you paid. And they had, obviously, lots of healthy snacks just for the taking. So it was a, it was a revelation. So there, there are lessons we can give in schools, in our workplaces, uh, that will also uh, convey the messages. And bringing together all of these sectors, as you described, uh, the educational sector, the foreign policy sector, the agriculture sector, the community uh, uh, design sector, the architecture community, the uh, people who are uh, involved in building uh, creation, and our educators all have a part in this. Thank you. Let me just pose one, one more question, and then we'll go to, I know there are a number of, of questions out in the audience as well, and, and we want to get to your insights and suggestions also. But let me just ask you to reflect a little bit on the nature of partnerships in addressing this challenge. and. Earlier, you uh, mentioned before we came in about some of the work that the Institute of Medicine is doing with national academies in sub-Saharan Africa and, and elsewhere. And that is an example of kind of institute to institute kind of partnership. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about that and also um, tell us how you see some of these um, public-private partnerships playing out with respect to thinking about this as we look towards September of 2011 and then beyond. When, we, when you think about uh, the major players now in, in global health, uh, it's true that the national players are still predominant. There's nothing for HIV, really, that compares to the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, in scale, in scope, 
uh, in its effects. Uh, but there's a lot of other players that are very, very important, including the non-government organizations and especially the leading foundations, in particular the Gates Foundation, changed the whole landscape of, uh, of the enterprise for, uh, for global health. What I think is uh, really important in the partnership strategies is to ensure that the recipient country and uh, partner has a dominant voice, not just an equal voice, but a dominant voice in what is actually done. And this is our greatest weakness, I would say, in most of our structured partnerships. It's not allowing a sufficient level of control to reside in the recipient countries. Now, interestingly, in the PEPFAR program, one of the really intriguing innovations was putting the program in the control of the ambassador in the country, which is a very interesting strategy for encouraging direct leadership to leadership coordination in country and to get away from a more sectoral uh, set of divisions. I think that uh, the more broad question about partnerships is a really important strategy for uh, making programs that will have not just uh, temporary success but durable success. And the successful partnership is always going to be, in my mind, one where both parties are gaining. A partnership which has a uh, asymmetrical uh, benefit structure is just not destined to last. And so you need to have both parties or all parties getting something out of it in order for it to, uh, to be sustainable. And I think if you uh, looked at the whole array of, of problems in the world uh, and you thought about things like uh, uh, nuclear threat, uh, threat of pandemic disease, threat of non-communicable disease, uh, and al aligned all of these threats where there are real opportunities for genuine mutual interest and partnerships that have mutual benefit, those are the ones where I think uh, we've got the most opportunity, and I would certainly include the non-communicable disease in that category. Should we turn to the audience? Yes. So, Dr. Feinberg, thank you for answering my questions. Sure. Um, let's now turn to our audience, and let me ask you when uh, you are um, when, uh, when you are recognized, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see right here around the, um, the podium, to take a microphone and introduce yourself and, and your affiliation. And please do speak into the microphone so that uh, those who are watching on the web can um, hear your questions as well. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Dr. Feinberg, Ward Cassell's here. Thank you for a terrific talk. Uh, my question relates to the September meeting of the United Nations General Assembly. What would you like them to do? What do you think they will do? And uh, are you concerned about r recent Republican proposals in our Congress this week to decrease funding to the United Nations? Will that impact what the World Health Organization does, or can that be circumscribed so that the WHO funding is maintained? It's certainly a concern to me. But yes. I'd love to have your thoughts about it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cassells, for your question. Uh, I, I want to tell you a little story of something that I learned when I was uh, visiting World Health Organization, which I thought was very uh, instructive for me. Uh, I was speaking to the uh, senior official there who's responsible for the uh, global response to emergencies generally. And he was describing the time uh, a year before that when uh, they had a visit uh, from a uh, congressman uh, from a Florida district. And before he, uh, before he came, uh, this WHO leader did a little uh, background check on the district. And when the congressman arrived, he showed the congressman a slide which compared the entire budget for the emergency response capacity of the World Health Organization to the budget of the fire department in the county that the congressman represented. And as you can imagine, the fire department's budget was larger than the budget 
at the World Health Organization. When he got to that slide, which he said was like his second or third slide, the congressman would not let him leave that slide. He kept saying, well, this can't be right. He said, this just, just cannot be the case, that you're protecting the entire world for less money than I have available in our fire department in the county. And of course, the answer was, that's the situation. Now, fundamentally, when you look at the task that the world has assigned to the World Health Organization, uh, and not to mention the UN more broadly, and you compare that to the resources that have been made available to execute on that assignment, the discrepancy is stark and very, very dangerous. And so survey after survey of the American public reveals that people want to give money for effective programs overseas. They believe that the U.S. must be donating 10 percent of its federal budget to foreign assistance, when, of course, it's, you know, a hundredth of that. And so uh, we are in a situation where public appreciation of the need and public perception of what we're actually doing is discordant from what the public would actually support and want to do if it could know the facts. And so I believe it's incumbent on uh, members of the Congress who are leaders and of the leadership in our, uh, in our executive branch to do their best to ensure that the facts are known, that the needs are known. Now, all of this, of course, goes without saying that we need to have adequate controls and accountability over the way any funds are expended on behalf of the public good, and it applies to us domestically as it would apply to our international agencies. But that's not really the central problem. In my mind, the central problem is that we simply have underfunded and overasked what we expect from our global agencies, and that's not a good recipe for success. Please, we'll take one and then the next here at the, the center table. Aaron Chokalinga from National Art, Art Lang and Blood Institute. Dr. Feinberg, thank you for that fine talk and for your wisdom. I think I couldn't be more happy when you emphasized on prevention. Now, the UN summit is happening in the next six months, and everybody's getting ready for it. And every heads of state, every minister of health, every minister of finance is confronted with the issue how to tackle with the health burden in, in every country. Under these circumstances, when the chronic disease is going to be discussed, of course, there will be more attention towards it. Now, in terms of prevention, when countries are spending anywhere between 15 to 75 to $100 per year per person in most countries, much of the funds will be devoted towards curative diseases. Now, what will be your advice to these heads of states who are going to be coming in a few months to put some of those funds towards prevention? Because yeah. there's always a competition for funding. And prevention doesn't get any funding at all. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the comment and the question. Uh, I think it's in fairness, uh, the underfunding of prevention is not exclusively a problem of the developing world. We in the United States also do not give adequate funding relative to its potential return, relative to its value for health to prevention. Uh, there are many reasons. Uh, for this, uh, one of which is the compelling character of treatment and the high cost of treatment, which uh, tends to take away these resources. I would say that one of the great advantages of the UN gathering is it will bring the ministers of finance as well as the ministers of health to the table. One of the great uh, difficulties in dealing 
with these uh, problems of non-communicable disease or any disease, in fact, is that it has to begin with budgetary realities and work uh, through the overall finance. I believe that the world can benefit from the example of countries that have succeeded and learn from their example. You could take uh, the example of Finland, take North Karelia example, take other examples like Costa Rica, take countries which relative to their wealth have done extremely well in prevention of disease and the longevity of their population, the limitation of infant mortality, and have succeeded for less doing more. And that's, I think, going to be a very important starting point of the discussion. Learn from the examples that have already been accomplished. And then secondly, I think that we can't just talk about these strategies in the abstract. We have to be able to come forward with very concrete uh, program proposals that a minister of finance can examine in context of their national priorities and understand what it would cost and what the likely benefits and when will they know and have the monitoring and surveillance in place to demonstrate whether it worked or not and whether it exceeded its expectations or fell short. But we need to have concrete uh, plans. And finally, I do think that we need to have a concerted global uh, financial support to encourage and reinforce and to help underwrite the cost of the threshold for prevention, getting over the threshold, because once you get over that threshold, the value of the returns will be evident, but you have to be able to get over that initial threshold. And there's where I think especially uh, global collaboration and funding can be important. So those are a few things that I would stress. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have another question here at the center table, please. Ed Berger, the uh, Eurasian Medical Education Program of the American College of Physicians. Let me touch uh, uh, a focus on one of the issues that you have touched on tangentially. As one who's been in the trenches for the last two decades on these matters, one of the observations that is undoubted has been the political momentum that has been very strongly skewed towards infectious diseases. And that has directed the, the, the course and sources of money as, matter, as well. As there, um, I would propose that we ought to think about making the case that there sh it is not an either or proposition, but in fact a balance that ought to be struck uh, in behalf of the global burden of disease. The burden of cardiovascular disease has such an enormous effect on the demography, the demographic trends in certain parts of the world at this point, to the extent that they will not, in fact, be altered without doing something about non-communicable disease. But it's that uh, political balance that has been uh, so telling and so influential that has kept non-communicable disease off the table to a great extent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your <coughs> comment, Dr. Berger. Appreciate it. Let's go to the back. We had a couple of questions. Someone has been very patient um, back here. I think our mic is, is not quite available in the back, so let me go over here um, to the <coughs> gentleman in the, the tan coat, please. Thank you. I'm Leon <coughs> Weinschaub, University of Wisconsin, Washington Semester in International Affairs. I'd like to ask you about one of the figures you, you mentioned early on about, I think you said 80% of the non-communicable diseases occur in third world and middle income countries. You stated that as a, a cause of, of, of concern. Now, as far as I know, the, in fact, the majority of the world's population is, in fact, in those countries. So perhaps it's not all that alarming if it's out of proportion. And uh, in responding to that, I wonder if you could also uh, share with us your, your knowledge of overall death rates in, in third world and developing countries as far as non-communicable and communicable diseases and how they uh, would, might compare with middle income or developed countries? Yes. Uh, those are uh, very, very good questions. The uh, 
point that I was, uh, that I was making was that 80 percent of the deaths from the non-communicable diseases occur in low- and middle-income countries. And your point is a very valid one. If 80 percent of the deaths occur there, but 85 percent of the population lives there, then actually proportionately uh, it's uh, fewer deaths as a fraction of the, of the world's population. The point, though, is when you do look at the rates per thousand of population, in the United States, uh, we have approximately 800 deaths per 100,000 people per year, just in, in round numbers. There are countries that have 10 times that. And in, in countries that have 5 or 10 times that, if the rate of death from communicable disease per 100,000 population will greatly exceed the rate from, uh, of the same uh, diseases per population in the United States. Uh, so what I can tell you is that the non-communicable disease burden per population rate in many low- and middle-income countries is, on an age-adjusted basis, uh, the greater than the burden in advanced countries. We just overall live longer and uh, live better. Keep in mind, uh, you know, the fundamental epidemiological fact is everyone dies once. So ultimately, you know, you're going to count every body and attribute to some disease. So the real question has to also be an age-specific uh, question. It's not simply counting a death at age 102 is not the same as at 60 or 52. So uh, these all have to play into it. But when you look at those in, with any, uh, any objectivity, uh, the stark burden of these noncommunicable diseases comes through in the low- and middle-income countries. To the back, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Elliot Benz from the Whitaker Group. Um, the term NCDs encompasses such a variety of different uh, diseases and health challenges. Uh, the effects uh, seems to be so great, and the populations on which um, the challenges will inevitably take place are in some of the most, you know, least resourced settings. If you were, say, the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. What are the, for lack of a better term, the surgical strikes? What are the priorities? You mentioned tobacco. Are there any, any other sort of specifics that you could offer? Well, thank you for, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the first thing that I would say to every Minister of uh, Health and Finance is you should look at the burden of disease in your own country. Uh, and don't be... Uh, uh, I would say, blinded by these general labels. As you point out, they cover wide varieties. And actually, keep in mind, it's always a little bit uh, unsatisfactory to define something by what it's not. You know, so this is the non-communicable disease. Well, that, that's a big basket, right? Uh, it does have the virtue that it's uh, an exhaustive alternative, that it's either communicable or non-communicable. That covers everything. It's sort of like being awake or asleep, you know. Pretty much, that's what you do during the day. Uh, although I can't tell with some of you exactly. I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, but now coming back to the to the point. So I'd begin with uh, the burden of disease in your country, and then uh, again the great the great insight and virtue of prevention is how broadly effective critical interventions can be across a spectrum of these problems. But among the top, the top targets certainly are going to be tobacco, diet, and exercise. You will find opportunities, especially in maternal and child health in many, many countries, especially where you're dealing with still high uh, infant mortality. You will find opportunities for reduction of uh, environmental uh, pollutants and other sources, especially in countries that have high indoor air pollution. Uh, and you will find uh, other targeted preventives, including screening uh, and particularly use of vaccines, though that's for the communicable disease. The things that you can do that will uh, have a great and, and uh, widespread benefit. But once you get past, you know, five or ten of them, you've probably hit 80 to 90 percent of your problem. And so it's not like you need to figure on four dozen lines of work. 
you could end up picking three or five and really dent the problem. Uh, yes, let's go back over here um, to the woman in the red jacket, please. Th thanks, Catherine, and thank you, Dr. Feinberg. I'm Nomon de Kundu from the Embassy of South Africa. I just was just wondering, you, as you were framing the nature dynamics and the extent of this problem globally, you identified it as a problem that is common across the board. I was just thinking if what your views were in terms of taking a leaf from what the HIV community has done in terms of globally mobilizing for resources, for epidemiological surveillance, for institutions to be in place. Do you think that this community, the NCD community, perhaps could benefit from that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment and question. Uh, the lessons from the experience with HIV, I think, are very, very relevant to every effort for disease control in the world. The, facts of HIV, although it's a communicable disease, it's also a chronic disease. And it's uh, increasingly a disease that is being managed in many countries in a way that people are living much more full and rewarding lives. Now, the relevant part of the HIV experience, as you describe, isn't so much the clinical, but rather the social mobilization that HIV demonstrated was possible, in fact, that it fostered. And I think one of the features that made it uh, possible as a global movement was this shared nature, where HIV was and is a problem both in industrialized and in developing countries. It was, especially in the early days of the outbreak, a disease problem that was appreciated as a huge threat everywhere. And that was an important feature in, uh, in the mobilization. In some ways, maybe the difficulty we have with heart disease or cancer is that they are too familiar. We're too accustomed to them. They've been around for a long time. It's not something we point to and say, ah, it's just arising. It's an emerging problem. It is, in fact, a dominating problem, but it's not brand new. And so one of the challenges for social mobilization will be in under the circumstances where you are trying to mobilize concerted action around a problem that has many of the qualities that make it, if you will, ripe for action. It's widespread prevalence. It's uh, dominating impact on a population. It's susceptibility to intervention. It has those qualities, but it's still has to have what's the precipitating event? What is it that will mobilize people? And that's why I think one of the reasons that this kind of gathering at the UN can be potentially very important, because it's at least a moment where we can galvanize our attention to the problem. And we need that in order to make the kind of uh, movements possible that you're describing. Uh, yes, we have uh, another question here at the center table, please. The microphones are coming from a bit of a distance. So. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. Um, as we prepare for the first UN summit on uh, NCD, I think it could be useful to be reflective and ask ourselves the question, what went wrong? Why is that the global health community uh, collectively um, uh, has not been able to bring NCD to the, the forefront of the public health agenda? Uh, the way we've been able to do with maternal and child health, malaria, TB, HIV, and so on and so forth. And on those, I mean, to be fair, there have been a few, uh, I would say, success or bright, uh, a good development. For example, the uh, Framework Convention for Tobacco Control, which was a really you know, an achievement. But by and large, the global health community has to be able to bring the NCT to the forefront in a comprehensive, systematic manner, the way we are doing now. So what went wrong? Thank you. Uh, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, but I'm very glad to see it's maybe starting to go right. Uh, I think that we have a lot of problems in health 
that we tend to overlook and just take them for granted. We tend to think that they are part of the landscape. They're just in the backdrop. They're just the way things are. We don't recognize them for what they are as preventable, avoidable sources of premature death and disability. I would submit that in the United States, that's kind of the way we think about violence. Most of us just kind of take it for granted. Well, yeah, people get shot every once in a while. Violence occurs. Uh, this is just uh, way, the way it is. But it isn't that way in most countries of the world. It's distinctly that way in the United States of America. But we haven't quite fully awakened to it. I think in the same way, for reasons we were discussing before, maybe because they're so familiar, they've been around for so long, there's not an, a day when you say, aha, it's now upon us, that the non-communicable diseases have a easier time just looking like they're part of the background, part of what we live with, part of what we expect. And I think a very important role for health leadership is to call out those preventable sources of premature death and disability and identify something to do about them. So I can't really explain why it has been relatively neglected in the past fully, but I can tell you that I'm very, very glad that's changing. Let's see, we have another question over here to the left. If we could have a microphone up here in the front on the left, please. Edward Kadunk, uh, Pan American Health and Education Foundation. I wanted to ask a question about the private sector involvement in this problem. It seems to me that the traditional uh, public health solutions to public health issues uh, has a hard time being applied to this uh, phenomenon that we're seeing. And at the same time, a lot of the solutions reside in the private sector. So uh, my question is, how can we um, develop a strategy that helps the international organizations uh, work more closely with the private sector in the solution of these problems. International public health organizations typically have a large amount of reticence in working with the private sector. They either see them as providing products that could prevent, uh, could pose the appearance of a conflict of interest, or that they produce uh, bad products, bad products being ones that have lots of sugar, lots of salt, lots of fat. How do we get that kind of a dialogue and cooperation going? Because I think uh, the issue larger than funding is how much of this is, uh, can be done from the private sector side without the need for public investment. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for the comment and, and the question. One of the things I was very pleased to hear from Catherine's uh, comments earlier is that the very next session in this series at CSIS is going to tackle exactly this issue. So I'm sure that there will be an opportunity to delve more deeply uh, into the opportunity. But I do think you put your finger on uh, the really critical nature of this challenge. And that is that the solutions do not reside in the traditional or predominantly in the traditional public health strategies and interventions alone. They require uh, a mobilization of intense engagement across the public and private sectors. They involve uh, the engagement across the education, agriculture, commerce, uh, and uh, environmental sectors beyond uh, what we typically think of as just, uh, just a health uh, project intervention. And I think that the organizations that offer uh, the forum for the kind of dialogue that you're describing where you can bring together the private sector, the public sector, the NGO sector, and public interest groups, as well as representatives of the public. You can have an honest exchange, and you can design and devise fresh ways of thinking, and maybe even some pilots, and demonstrate how successes can be, can be mounted. Uh, all of these, I think, uh, will have a place. The, the, challenge of the non-communicable, the chronic uh, diseases, the heart disease, the cancers, the diabetes, and all the others that we're focusing on, they will not yield to a single thrust of an intervention and, and the problem is solved. They're going to require a variety of sustained 
uh, interventions. And a big part of that, I believe, is going to be just what you call for, which is the collaboration and intersection of the public and private sectors. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that this uh, will have uh, some opportunity for further elaboration in the next uh, discussion here. Uh, yes, we have a, a question here in the back, the second table from the, my left, I guess the right. Thank you. Uh, Duale Tulane University. Uh, I was wondering if you look at the, uh, the health workforce in both countries that will be needed to really tackle the NCDs in addition to communicable diseases. Because when the HIV-8 uh, program started, they said most of us country cannot handle because we don't have the workforce. Have you looked at uh, the one for the NCD? Yeah. It's a very important uh, point that you raise on the health workforce and its preparedness to cope with the uh, burden of the non-communicable diseases. Uh, there was uh, just recently uh, published in uh, The Lancet a report of an independent global commission on the future global health workforce that uh, describes the needs for the workforce at all levels to do the kinds of, uh, have the kinds of capacities and mutually reinforcing training and practice patterns that will more efficiently deliver uh, the services that people need. When you look honestly at the situation in many countries, the facts of the matter are that there is uh, a dearth of adequately trained, available health professionals to care for and meet the needs of that uh, population. That is a fundamental uh, reality and a challenge, uh, a challenge to, uh, to all of us. Uh, other countries, uh, including the United States, are places that uh, people come who are health professionals and are uh, able uh, le both logically and individually to uh, pursue a career that makes sense for them here, but which in turn means that they are not available to contribute to uh, solutions to health problems uh, in, their, uh, in their home countries. And so that's another part of the, uh, of the mix, including the idea of getting opportunities for more health professionals from countries like the United States to spend time in countries where the needs are even uh, much greater. So that's another part of uh, a potential solution here. Uh, but overall, I would say that the infrastructure, the uh, health workforce, the availability of uh, necessary drugs, devices, other intervention tools, these are all part of a, uh, uh, a package of what you need to be uh, thinking through as you design uh, intervention strategies that you have a prospect of working. So it's a, your point is, I think, very well taken. There are a number of questions out here, and we're, we're getting close to the time for, of our close. So let me take two or three questions at a time, and then we'll ask Dr. Feinberg to answer them and, and wrap up. Uh, let's see, there's one right over here, please. Thank you. Fatumata Bachili from HHS. My question is, it makes sense for um, the global community to, to tackle infectious diseases, but what, will, what should be the message, uh, WHO message for developed countries to tackle this at the global level? We have our own problems here in the US. Why should we help other countries deal with um, NCDs? Why, sh why should we do it? Thank you. So then there was another question at the table in the back, please. One, I'm going to maybe answer somewhat of a previous question about the workforce. Uh, I don't know if many people here know, but NIH, along with PEPFAR and many other federal agencies, have put together a medical education partnership initiative for workforce training uh, in the medical and research fields in many of the developing nations. That's a $130 million initiative, so I think that is the start, $130 million over five years, that's the start of an initiative to really train the workforce. And a lot of that initiative is to really keep the workforce in the developing nations, because a lot of the times this trained cadre of medical researchers and uh, doctors will leave the, the developing countries. Another question, uh, a question that I have actually is, what can we do as a nation in order to dovetail with the efforts of other nations, both 
developed nations as well as developing countries in terms of really uh, joining forces and reducing the burden of uh, non-communicable non -communicable diseases, both from the research level all the way up to the government policy level. Thank you. Thank you, and let's take one more um, right here in the center, please. My name is Yuan Liu from one of the National Institute of uh, Health Institute, the National uh, Institute of Neurological Disorder and Stroke. I'm very glad that you mentioned about neurodegenerative diseases could be uh, a big burden for global wise. So my question actually is more a suggestion for um, for CSIS for the future seminars. So you, in your very inspiring speech, you talk about actually it's a, it's to the of the central interest of the U.S. to support global health research. What we learn from other countries can largely benefit to our country. But in our in our country, both at the public level and even at the scientific research community level, because funding now is very tight, people have felt very hesitant to send money abroad to study global health issues. So that's the imbalance you mentioned about underfunded and um, not meet the task with the need. So I would, my suggestion is to collect a, a series of success stories that happened in global health research that really largely benefit our country, for example, in heart or, or stroke, like our institute is responsible, that can be translated to the prevention and treatment in this country, and then put that as a material for, educa for education or information for our Congress, for the public, and for the scientific research community, then we can have more funding for Global House. So a question about, you know, the U.S. is struggling to address its own problems here. Why, why does it make sense for us to help others? Um, another about how do we dovetail and coordinate uh, with other countries to ensure that we make the maximum impact for this challenge? And then a, a suggestion, but also a, um, just a reflection about the importance of collecting success stories. Yeah. Oh, please. Well, thank you very much for the questions and the comments. I have appreciated uh, also the uh, comment about the training program that's initiated under the uh, NIH and PEPFAR now. It's a very important uh, component of the U.S. initiative and, a, and an important uh, element to keep in mind. Uh, I, I think, too, that the uh, making the case, uh, several of the points were really around how do you make the case for U.S. engagement uh, in non-communicable diseases. Uh, and why does it seem more logical for communicable diseases as compared to non-communicable? Uh, I think we have to ask ourselves the question, well, why do we care especially about the communicable disease? Well, maybe you'd say, well, those diseases we care about because they really do represent a big burden in the other countries, and they could even affect us. Uh, you know, the, the, if we don't stop certain diseases, it could come to our shores. Well, I think you make exactly the parallel arguments with some slight variations when it comes to non-communicable disease. The reason to deal with non-communicable disease begins with a recognition that we want to reduce the burden of illness in the world. If you begin with that assumption, then you want to know, well, what is it exactly that's producing that burden? To what extent is it one disease or another? And to what extent can interventions that we might mount uh, benefit across a spectrum of those diseases? And when you begin to lay out the case that way, many of the chronic non-communicable diseases really come to the fore as targets of opportunity and humanitarian need, both. That we can, uh, by investing smartly, really make a, a big difference for the world. I really appreciated the suggestion that we need to, we need to bring forward the case examples that will show where interventions and lessons from other parts of the world have redounded to the benefit of the U.S. public because that will help reinforce the notion that research is a global enterprise and the knowledge that is gained anywhere can be of use uh, everywhere. And that, I think, is uh, 
a very, uh, a very important uh, message to reinforce by example, as was suggested, and I think that's a, a, a wonderful uh, challenge to those who want to make the case to be able to come forward with these examples. There's no doubt, and uh, let me say, the pharmaceutical companies have discovered long ago that they can uh, certainly conduct many trials less costly and with, uh, with high uh, reliability in different parts of the world. They don't have to conduct all those trials in uh, uh, countries like the U.S. or Western Europe. And uh, I think there are some uh, real lessons to be learned again from the private sector in this as well uh, that may apply to uh, the public. And finally, I would say that, to my mind, a way of, of, of ensuring the dovetailing of resources in a way that's genuinely contributory to the needs of the developing countries is to allow the leadership in the developing countries to have a very powerful voice in what is done. It's the partnership concept that is respectful of the prerogatives of the recipient who is in the best position to know about priorities, coordination, and needs. And that, I think, is uh, a good point for us, perhaps, to conclude. So thank you all very much. Dr. Feinberg, thank you for taking the time this afternoon to share your experience, insights, and perspective with us. I hope you all will agree with me that this was a fabulous way to start the speaker series and provide a, a broad overview and, and set of challenges as, for us to think about and consider as we look toward the UN Summit in September. Uh, let me just uh, remind those of you um, who weren't able to pick up a copy when you came in, uh, the Institute of Medicine has recently released, a, I think it's a summary of a report on the effects of cardiovascular disease in low and middle income countries, and so there are um, copies outside if you would like to pick one up uh, on your way out. And finally, let me just remind you again that our next event in this series uh, will feature Jean-Luc Battel, Medtronic, uh, at, on tackling the global NCD epidemic, how the private sector can and should be part of the solution. Uh, this will take place on February 16th um, at a slightly different location. We'll be at the Kaiser Family Foundation offices over in Metro Center, and that'll be from 9.30 to 11 a.m. So look for information about that, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thank you all.